welcome to the Water Talks organized by the Water Institute. My name is Roy Brouwer. Um, from the Water Institute, we're very happy to see you here again. This is the last Water Talk, unfortunately, of the year. Um, we don't have one for December, but we'll be back in January. I'll get back to that on, uh, later. Let me just uh, acknowledge that we participate today from traditional territory um, of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Um, we're located on the Haldeman Track, as you perhaps know, no, <clears throat> six miles on each side of the, of the Grand River, as displayed here on the, on the map. Um, we're very happy to have Professor Belinda Sturm uh, with us, uh, talk about uh, wastewater process uh, intensification. I'll just briefly go through her uh, uh, biosketch, which is very impressive. She's a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering at the University of Kansas and the statewide director of the Kansas National Science Foundation um, and their EPSCOR program, which is the established program to stimulate competitive research. Um, she joined Kansas in 2006. She served as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Research from 2018 to 2022. Um, and at the national and international level, Dr. Sturm served, uh, uh, serves on the board of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors um, as chair of the Water Environment Federation's Municipal Design Symposium um, and as past chair of the International Water Association's USA National Committee Executive Board. Uh, she uh, obtained her bachelor in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a PhD in civil engineering and geological sciences from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Dr. Storm's primary research interest is in the use of microbial communities in water reclamation reclamation and resource recovery from municipal wastewater um, and in 2012 um, the American Academy of Environmental Engineers awarded Belinda an excellence in environmental engineering honor award for her research on coupling nutrient removal with algae mediated energy recovery and then 10 years later in 2022 the Water Research Foundation awarded Belinda the Paul Bush Award to further research um, for further research on aerobic granule Slush. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Dr. Belinda Sturm to the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I um, would like just a quick show of hands if you're um, an engineer. Great. And then a quick show of hands if you know anything about microbial ecology or biological principles. Okay. So I'm going to give, give each of you a little bit. I'm going to start first by defining this term intensification, which means something rather specific in the wastewater field. This is a picture, an aerial, of the largest wastewater treatment plant in the United States. It's DC Water. They have an ongoing argument with Chicago as to which one's larger, but I'm not going to wade into that debate today. This is DC Water. When you look at it, it is landlocked and waterlocked. There is nowhere to grow. So all political jokes aside, the DC area is going to add folks to their population in the coming years. And there are just a few options. You can build a new treatment plant, which is very hard to do, or you could figure out how to add capacity to this treatment plant. And that is, that is what I mean by intensification. It has economic impacts, it has political impacts, it has all of the things that you think about when building urban infrastructure. We're gonna simplify that into this flow diagram. All right, so this is a biological treatment train. I specialize in the biology that happens in this tank. But from an intensification perspective, there are two things I'm going to talk about today. The first is what dictates the hydraulic capacity of that plant. Right? The hydraulic capacity of a treatment plant is dependent on this unit process, the secondary clarifier. And the principle of this is, is very basic. How fast something settles in that clarifier dictates how much flow you can put through that unit. Right? And we have just an algebraic expression to, to solve for how big that clarifier is or how much flow you can push through there. Now, what dictates the treatment capacity, though, is the biology. Right? So the hydraulic capacity is dictated by that secondary clarifier and the settling of the sludge. 
that, that, that settling rate. And the treatment capacity is dictated by how much the biology can do to, to eat up or to consume all of the waste, the soluble waste. The other important thing from a climate change or a resource management perspective is that 70% of the energy, and there's a lot of energy to run that big, that big plant I showed you, is consumed in this aeration tank. Right, so if we can intensify these two unit processes, we can do quite a bit to, um, to make wastewater treatment more sustainable and to allow our populations to continue to grow. All right, so I'm gonna go into a little bit of that hydraulic capacity first to try to convince you that, um, that my research is, is something you wanna hang on to a little bit more as we delve into some biological principles. So these are the 10 state standards. This is a traditional design standards in the United States. And what I wanna point out is that this gives you how much flow you can put through a clarifier and it's based on the type of biology that that you have. So it's our very um, not scientific empirical way to say if you, if you cultivate different types of biology, you can have different flow rates and that's because different biology has different settling rates. All right, so we have in the past 20 years, I've been working in the space of growing granular sludge, developing granular sludge since my PhD work. Um, traditionally, we have wastewater that utilizes flocular sludge or activated sludge. Um, activated sludge has been around for a little over 100 years, so it's not new. It's still the basis of our treatment capacity. And I'm gonna use a lot of this word SVI, which stands for sludge volume index. Um, the higher the number, the, the less settling rate, and the, I'm like, there's a lot behind that statement I'm not gonna go into, but flocular sludge, activated sludge, is what we typically design for. On the other end of this, you have granular sludge, and these have SVIs that are very compact and these settle very quickly. They settle at nine meters per hour, and that means that we can push a lot of flow through those basins. Now, granular sludge is, um, Cop is trademarked, and there are only a few um, design engineers that are allowed legally to design these plants. In between, you have what I'm gonna define as densified activated sludge. It's not patented, right? So um, that opens up the market. Anyone who can understand the principles of this can begin to optimize their treatment plant to reap the benefits of faster settling sludge without getting into a trademark situation. All right, so I'm gonna briefly show you how this, how this makes big numbers work, and then I'm gonna go into how you would actually uh, you know, design the biology and go into some biological principles. So densifying activated sludge is key to increasing the capacity of water and resource recovery facilities, WRRFs. So that's the, the new way to refer to wastewater treatment. Um, we're, we're, we treat the water, but we also recover the water. So I ran a pilot at the Lawrence, Kansas wastewater treatment plant. These are um, eight inch diameter pipes, um, somewhat tall. I don't know, everyone, everybody's tall for me. They're tall, I can't reach the top of them. Um, but they were pulling primary effluent. So this is real wastewater that we ran these pilots for about two years. This was part of a water research foundation study. And from the granular sludge that we, we cultivated in this system, we did a traditional flux curve analysis. So this is um, a traditional standard method to, to use in a model for how much capacity can you push through a clarifier. We did this by sieving the sludge and we had flocculent sludge and we had granular sludge, which was defined as over 200 microns in diameter in a sieve. And then we did different mixtures of those. And you let this settle for 30 minutes and you measure the settling rate and you push that into a, a model. All right, so the, the flux curve model that you get, at the bottom of this, we have 100% um, flocculent sludge. And at the top, I have 100% granular sludge, and then we did different ratios in between. 
you can fit that into the Vesselind number, and you can pull out of that the hydraulic capacity of a clarifier. Right? So I'm, I'm speeding over some of the engineering principles here, but what you can see is these different curves, and you can pull out uh, the different uh, parameters from this. So I had a colleague at Brown and Caldwell and at Hazen, those are um, major engineering firms, and they ran a clarifier model with these numbers, with these Vesselin parameters numbers. This is a one, one dimension computational fluid dynamic model of the clarifier that is sized for the Lawrence, Kansas wastewater treatment plant. All right, so I'm going to go through this. On the y-axis, we have the peak flow capacity, a million gallons per day. And then we have the effluent suspended solids concentration, which is the red line. So if you have 100% flocculent sludge, the hydraulic capacity of this clarifier is 8 million gallons per day, predicted by the, the CFD model. That is actually perfectly what the 10 state standards would tell you that clarifier is, right? So 10 state standards work, right? If you, if you assume you have activated sludge, um, the clarifier models, those, those empirical models work for our design. Eight million gallons per day. If you have 50% of your sludge is this dense granular sludge, you more than double that capacity and it's 20 million gallons per day. And you'll notice that the modeled effluent suspended solids does not increase significantly. So a lot of people get nervous about that. Traditionally, operators get nervous when they have good settling sludge because they think that you'll have pen flocks that increase your effluent suspended solids. So what I'm showing here is that if you're in that in-between spot, you don't lose effluent quality and you more than double your hydraulic capacity. So if you, go, if you go to DC Water, that big plant, and you say, I can more than double your hydraulic capacity if you can densify your sludge 50%, they get interested in that, that calculation, right? Now, if you go to 100% granular, the capacity really jumps up, but you start to lose a little bit of effluent suspended solids quality. All right, so I am, I've used this figure for many years to, um, to work with engineers to say, we don't have to go and buy the trademarked granular sludge system. If you apply biological principles, you can, you can get some of those benefits with your existing design. But this requires us to understand how do you get these densified um, sludge particles to form. All right, so in design, we have many of our existing treatment plants utilize continuous flow systems. That's this large footprint. This is the existing infrastructure that exists. And what I will argue and what my work has shown is how do we, how do we work with this? This is already built infrastructure. Millions and billions of dollars have already been invested in this. So how can we optimize this system to increase capacity? Now on the flip side of this, we do have um, sequencing batch reactors. And this is that trademark technology. And actually my PhD is on sequencing batch reactors. So I'm a huge fan of them. I, I'm not against them. They're just not the current capital that's already been built in many cases. So there are some really differences between these two different flow processes. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit into this. Um, I've, I've talked to you about that hydraulic capacity, and that's definitely why people are interested in densified activated sludge or granular sludge, how, how to increase the hydraulic capacity. But there are also some really interesting processes that happen when you have a granule, this is a picture of one of my granules, that is 500 microns in size. If you think about this from a mass transfer perspective, oxygen in the bulk phase is penetrating into this particle. And so what happens, and Hazen, they have people who are fancier than me, they, they draw these, these layers into the granule 
So this would be aerobic. This outer layer, as oxygen's penetrating, you would have an aerobic layer. Inside, you would have an anoxic layer. And in the middle, you would have an anaerobic layer. This starts to mean that we would have different types of microbial communities that are active all within this particle. And if we can optimize them, we can increase that biological treatment capacity. I was talking about hydraulic. Now I'm going to switch to biological capacity. So when I was a student, and I always, I always have this slide because when I'm teaching students, I, I, my students get tired of me saying this, but you always go back to the literature. So many of the things I'm going to tell you are not um, new biological principles that were just discovered. These were things that we've been talking about for 50 or 60 years. And this is really, in my mind, an extension or pushing the boundaries of some of those biological principles. So for many years, there's a, a whole group of literature called bulking sludge. All right, so that's the opposite of granular, granular sludge. Bulking sludge is when you have sludge that will not settle. And so a lot of the work was, how do we get rid of the biology that does not settle? And I flipped it around and I say, well, if you can get rid of the biology that doesn't settle, you can select for the biology that does settle. Right? So it's, it's almost looking at the literature in reverse. When, and this is a, an operator manual. It's present in a lot of full-scale treatment plants. And it is called the Manual and Causes of Bulking and Foaming Sludge. And when you look into this manual, you'll see that there are operating parameters that are known to select for good settling sludge. So SRT control, sludge residence time, food to microorganism gradients, and selector zones and plug flow. So I'm going to talk a lot about um, F to M gradients and selector zone and plug flow. Now, in, when this book was written, wastewater treatment plants were pretty simple. They were designed just to do aerobic biological treatment. Um, now they're much more complicated because we perform nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So we have many more different basins. Um, but if you, if you look through this literature with a specific goal, there's a lot there that you can bring forward into today. So this is from 1973, right? And in 1973, they, ha they are basically showing that when you go from a complete mix system to an extreme plug flow, that you can create these very low SVIs. Now, they didn't use the word granular sludge in 1973, but this is definitely granular sludge for, by today's definition. So you have to go and you have to look at that and you have to fit it to today's understanding of our process models. And so today's, this is today's understanding of what's happening in that system. You have over here a very traditional um, biological selection graph where you have substrate concentration and you have specific growth rate. And this is telling us that non-filamentous organisms or good settling organisms will grow faster when they have more substrate concentration. And the bad guys, or the filaments, will grow faster when they have low substrate concentration. So there's a kinetic model for that. It's up here. And the kinetic model, QS, is the rate of substrate uptake. Right? And this tells us that when we have a lot of substrate concentration, we have fast substrate uptake rates. And in fast forward to 2003, Martins published this schematic that showed when you're near max substrate uptake rates, which would happen over here in high substrate concentrations, you get these granular particles to be selected. So if you look at this, you say, OK, what I need to do is I need to have a region of my design that has high substrate concentrations and high substrate uptake rates. And the way we do that is to, to design selectors. Right, so selector would be the way this has been implemented in design. But this is the principle to that. 
I showed this um, during my PhD, and I, I, I show this picture because it's going to, to fast forward to my current work on the surface. Um, but during my PhD, I ran a bunch of reactors. I'm showing three of them right here. And I've got time over here, and I've got substrate COD. And you can see if I, if I accumulate a lot of substrate, and you can take the slope of that line to look at substrate uptake, that is where I formed this granule particle. And if I only allowed the substrate to come up to 100, and I have a low substrate uptake rate, I selected for filaments. Still in, a, still in a particulate form, but it's a really great visual of why substrate uptake matters, right? And you can manipulate this in a reactor design. So my first two lessons, I'm gonna give you four lessons in this lecture, and these are the conclusions. The first two is that not all granule particles have the same morphology or surface properties. And I, this is my current work, is manipulating that surface to increase biological capacity. And I show you this, right? So this would be the ideal granule, and this is probably gonna create problems, that it will not settle as fast as this will. This will have a lot of drag, right? And then the second is that substrate uptake kinetics matter. That is the biological principle that's dictating these different morphological forms. So about 10 years ago, I met these two gentlemen. Um, Sudhir Murthy was the lead process innovation officer at DC Water, and Charles Bott is the lead innovation officer at Hampton Road Sanitation District. And I wrote a proposal with them that was funded by the National Science Foundation. So this was um, really a turning point in my career because it was the first time I'd really worked with a such large facilities. I'd worked with smaller utilities until then. And also because they patented a technology called a hydrocyclone. So I started to look at hydrocyclones in this. But the purpose of this project was how do we take these principles that I learned from sequencing batch reactors and apply them to those continuous flow processes. All right, so this was what I just showed you from a sequencing batch reactor. You can look at the substrate uptake. It's, it's rather, it, it models like a batch reactor. In a continuous flow configuration, and this was the schematic we proposed, we proposed that if we have anaerobic selectors, we can have high substrate concentrations that step down over those selectors, and then they enter the aerobic portion which is just the typical activated sludge. And I suggested that this would yield the same type of biology because fundamentally we are creating a zone of high substrate uptake rate. So that project um, turned into another project which was, which was a lot bigger. This project was funded by the Water Research Foundation and it included seven full-scale facilities in three countries. And my portion of it was over here. I was looking at the substrate uptake kinetics, the biological principles. And all of my partners were looking at that hydrocyclone implementation. All right, so this project um, was published about six years ago and it's moved on, but it, it really made some of the science that I was learning, it got it into the industry right away. And, and I just wanna emphasize that because really the benefit of working with utilities and engineers is to get the science into practice as fast as possible. So I'm gonna introduce this hydrocyclone unit and I'll talk briefly about it. Down here, this is an external unit that basically selectively wastes flocks and keeps granules. I am very focused on biological selection, the biological principles. This is adding a physical selection to it. And, and we've studied one by itself, them together, one separate, right? So we, we have studied them individually to see what the contribution of each have been. 
right, so back to those pilots. So in this, in both the NSF study and in the WARF study, they were happening at the same time. I operated these pilots at the treatment plant. And in one of them, I am looking at just substrate selection, just biological selection. And in the other pilot, I did sieve the biomass through a sieve daily. This was so much work for the students because you, there's not a hydrocyclone that works at that small of a uh, scale. But we did look at biological and physical selection together. And I'm just going to present the biological results first of just, just when we manipulated the substrate kinetics. And I'm going to present them in terms of F to M. So F to M is the engineering operator's way to talk about QS, substrate uptake rate. It's a little bit more accessible for, for operators. They don't have to see a kinetic equation. And F to M is basically the COD, the amount of substrate, divided by the amount of biomass. So the higher the F to M, the higher the substrate, the higher the, the kinetic um, Q, mat, Q max. And then on the um, y-axis, I've got EPS for one graph. And on the other, I've got average diameter of the sludge. So in order to do this, I actually manipulated the F to M over a year period. So each of these dots is an average steady state of operating that reactor at a specific F to M. There's a tremendous amount of work hidden in these two figures, OK? Um, what you can see is that we, we had granules that did, in fact, grow when we increased the F to M. And a lot of people use a cutoff of 0.2. It's, it's actually a fairly arbitrary cutoff, but a lot of people use a 0.2 cutoff. And if you come down, you can say, OK, an F to M of about 0.18 or 0.2 um, gets us to that granules, granular sludge. Now, what I'm showing is another reason for this is that we also form a compound called extracellular polymeric substances. So the biology, not only do you select for, get rid of the bad biology, the filaments, but the biology that you do select with, they have so much substrate, they have so much carbon, that they begin to produce extracellular carbon. And that's called EPS. And these are images of EPS. The blue is polysaccharide, and the red is cell. This is a flock, and this is a granule. And you can just see that most of the surface is actually EPS. All right. And so, and this has been validated by a colleague, um, in, not in this study, but showing substrate utilization rate versus EPS. Right. I, I showed the graph as F to M. He showed it as substrate utilization rate. You can definitely convert between the two. And really, the implication for this is substrate uptake kinetics matter because they select for biology, but because they also produce EPS, which is a glue that helps these, these particles form. So I did that work in an SBR. In order to relate that to a, a continuous flow system, I had to make a few assumptions. And I did that, and I came up with a graph, and I published this graph. And this is my engineering guidance for full-scale design engineers of how they should design a selector zone, what F to M they should design, and how that would benefit SVI versus EPS. So this, this was really good work, and it was critical work. But it was work done in sequencing batch reactors. So I'm going to come back to more recent work that takes these guiding principles and tests it at full scale. So the third lesson I've got here is that substrate profile can change granule EPS properties. All right, so I'm going to switch now, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about newer work because it's, it's exciting. I, I love what I do. I've been studying these like little balls of biology for 20 years now, and I'm always, I'm always learning things. Um, first, I want to say that 
the ongoing work, that F to M guidance that I did, has been taken up by Denver Metro Water Recovery, full scale facility, and um, Pushka Regmi was with Brown and Caldwell at the time. He's now moved to Stantec, but they received an additional award from the Water Research Foundation, and we recently just published. So we tested that F to M um, at full scale at Denver Metro, and we published um, this document in continuous flow work. So I, I'm very excited for this to be out there now and for engineers to, to begin using it. Um, it. It, like the basic science was the basic science, right? The numbers changed a little bit because I had to make some assumptions to convert the SBR to continuous flow, but the, the science was the science. All right, so the new stuff. So research has largely focused on granule formation but as I have been studying the EPS and that surface property of the granule, um, my, my new work is really focused on what I call the reactive surface, right? So the, the particle itself matters, the density, the settling velocity, but the surface properties, there's some stuff going on there. That EPS is a major product of the biology and it, it has physical principles properties that, um, that matter. So this is what I wrote my Paul Bush um, proposal for and that my Paul Bush Award research is on. And I'll, I'll show you some of the preliminary results that aren't published yet. Um, so I took this image in 2005. And, which makes me start to feel old, but I want to tell you if you're a student, um, this was a day, it was, it was a Saturday in a microscopy lab for me, and I was really just trying to get a pretty image for a publication that, that I was putting out. But you never know when things are going to come back. So, so this came back about 15 years later as I started to, to see those F to M trends with EPS. And then another image I took during my PhD um, was this one. It's a light microscopy picture. Um, it shows a granule, not as smooth, uh, maybe why I didn't make it into the publication, and not as beautiful. Um, but you see all these things hanging off of it? Those are protozoa, those are stalked ciliates. And in, in wastewater treatment, we have largely ignored the protozoa community for a long time. The, the treatment capacity is performed by microorganisms, by, by bacteria. But when I started to, to see some of the new things, I started to think about these two different images. The first, you have um, a polymer, biologically produced polymer, but a polymer that has some physical properties. And then the second, we have this, this other type of biology that we have completely ignored, but is obviously active at the surface of the granule. And at the time, I was working with um, a microplastics project. So I was a totally separate project, but we were starting to look at microplastics and wastewater treatment. And I was looking at pathogens because it was COVID and everyone was looking at pathogens during COVID. Um, I, did, I, I was performing the wastewater surveillance COVID work for Kansas at the time. And then I went back and I looked at um, some work that we had done during the PhD. And this was published, but it was sort of a one-off study that I had done with a collaborator at the time. But in, in Munich, I was working in Munich at the time, we were working on brewery wastewater that has a lot of particulate uh, substrate. And we could observe the particulate substrate being caught and captured, absorbed to the granule surface. And we, we published that at the time, and we even published that the protozoal community mattered for that. But then we published it, and I filed it away, and I didn't think about it again for, for many years. Um, so in, in this study, we actually were using fluorescently labeled microbeads to understand the absorption of the, those particulates. You can buy these, these microplastic beads that are fluorescently labeled. And we did some work where we, we could see the microplastics, but at that time I was really not thinking microplastics, I was thinking about particulate carbon. 
In today's era, I was thinking about microplastics. So I had a postdoc at KU, and we ordered these beads again, and we ran small reactors, small sequencing batch reactors, and we tracked the absorption of microplastics to the granule over just nine days. All right, so this is, I mean, we were like heavily loading the microplastics because we were just trying to see if they were captured to the to the surface, but the images were very clear that the granule surface was capturing these fluorescently labeled microbeads on the surface. And then we actually did sectioning, so you can take those granules, you can section them very thin, cryo sections, and we looked um, at 20 micron layers, and you can look at whether the the microplastics are penetrating into the surface or just getting stuck on the surface. So, for instance, here, this green is labeled protein. Protein is one of the polymers, and this is the edge of the granule. And the blue is the polysaccharide, and then this is combined. And it's very hard to see, so I have these, these areas here, but these are micro-labeled plastics. And if you overlay these, you can start to see them penetrating. And we were doing this because we wanted to see if they were being absorbed to the polysaccharides or the proteins. So we were starting to try to look at the, the properties. So proteins would have different absorption than polysaccharides. All right, and this is, I put this out of order, but this was the work where we showed in that, that Mont House wastewater um, epistillus stalked ciliates, and at the time we were showing that they were ingesting these micro labeled, these fluorescently labeled microbeads. All right, so I was sort of doing that work, and I was focused on microplastics and, and granule, and then I got this email from um, Denver Metro, who I'd been collaborating with. And the email was simply, we're, we're doing these pilots with you, um, and our, our pilot that has granule sludge, we have less E. coli coming out of that train than we have in the activated sludge train. And this was the data they sent me. All right, so this was back um, in 2020. They sent me this data, and this is their densification train over four or five months, and this is the E. coli coming out, and it's, it's two logs lower than their activated sludge train. And their email to me was, do you think this is real? What do you think's happening? Right? And so that got me thinking about that work during my PhD, and um, so that's, I wrote a proposal to look at the stalked ciliates. Right, so these are completely separate studies, but they're all kind of in this brain hop, like, I don't know, this is what I think about when I'm not doing the work I'm supposed to be doing, right? So I, I wrote this proposal, and for the last two years, we have gotten samples from them, and we've looked at the microscopy and tracked the protozoa, and we've also done sequencing on that. And um, the, the take home message to this is that the stalked ciliates are the green bar, right? And we completely see those ciliates being selected for when granules are selected. And um, I do have correlation data now that I, I'm about to publish that shows very clearly that the stalked ciliates are involved in the E. coli removal in the system. And the mechanism is ingestion, like, like we've been observed. Um, all right, so I, wanna, I want to um, come to a close here. Um, I will say that this is pretty different for me. I've studied um, activated sludge bacterial populations for a long time. Now I'm getting to know stock ciliates, and, um, and that, that's fun. It's one of the things I like about research. You know, you can go chase, chase a new thing. Um, I do think it matters. I think it will matter for microplastics removal. I think it will matter for, for pathogen removal. But it's shocking how little we understand about protozoal selection and activated sludge versus the other. And I'll just say, fun fact, um, the density of vorticella microsystoma, which is a, a type of ciliate, 
Um, they can, one individual per mil can consume 10 to the three bacteria per milliliter per hour. So I found this in a paper because I was really just trying to get a sense of like, could this get me a couple log difference? And it can. Like it, it's, it's like the numbers, this is just from like some pure microbiology study. The numbers sort of check out. Um, I am gonna close there so that we have time to talk. I could talk about this stuff um, for like days. Um, but I'll just say I, I've been fortunate to have funding from several people I've mentioned. I've been fortunate to have a great group and a great family. And I'll just end with that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's time for questions. Anyone who wants to start? Please, Wayne. You see, oh, yeah, sorry. So you started off your talk about um, the air oxygen requirements, aeration energy requirements yeah. and for activated sludge treatment. And yeah. so in these, I guess, larger scale implementations, what are they seeing in terms of impacts on aeration yeah. energy? Yeah, so um, that was like a group of five slides that I didn't talk about because I want to have time. But now that you've asked, um, I'm going to. Um, so one of my current studies is with, um, with Worf again and Brown and Codwell and Black and Veatch. And we're actually lowering the dissolved oxygen. That's sort of a new, a new area is how do we, how do we operate at, at dissolved oxygen at so 0.3 to 0.5. Um, to, to get to that. I think traditionally at granular sludge, they have operated DOs at conventional DOs because they were afraid to drop the DO. So we don't have a lot of full-scale da data from that. Um, but in this study, we're operating um, pilot continuous flow, which took, took me a while to get working because I've always worked with SBRs. But we do have a continuous flow um, at Lodeo, and I'll just point out these 3D printed weirs, think, thanks to my teenage son who printed those for me. Um, but, but we are seeing good performance um, in this. And this, this report's about to come out. I'll just leave the numbers here because um, this is the effluent quality, and this is at 0.3 to 0.5, so we're seeing good removal in two different trains, um, good subtle abilities, and then we've measured nitrous oxide emissions and they're also low. Um, so maybe we're gonna meet later and I can talk about that. Yeah. Thank you, anyone else? Michael? Yeah, um, thank you for a nice talk. I'm just interested to uh, your comment on the human probiotic organisms that does something to whatever comes out yeah. and then you're processing it at the, the other yeah. end. Can you comment on the relationship whether there are some similarity between the organisms, you know, human body probiotic mm -hmm. and, and what you're trying to do in yeah. after they come out of this? Yeah, so um, from, from a traditional biological process design, we grow the biology we need to do the treatment. And the uh, fecal biology is not involved. So the fecal biology that, um, and this makes sense if you think about just from this perspective, our body temperatures are 97 degrees, or I don't know, y'all are on Celsius, so, um, right. So, but we're hot, right? And then the activated sludge process operates at 12 degrees Celsius, to 28 degrees Celsius. I'm much better in Celsius for biology than humans. I don't really do humans. All right, but, but our biology in our bodies is, is selected and operates very differently than the biology in a treatment train. And so they die very quickly. So the, the fecal matter that we sh shed, the biology we shed, is anaerobic, hot, and when they get to a conventional activated sludge system, they don't really do anything useful for us. We have to disinfect them so we don't get sick. But they, they're, no, they're not useful for me. Um, 
My, back when I used to be on that platform now called X, which I now am not on anymore, but my handle was let the microbes do the work and uh, human microbiome bacteria don't do anything for me in treatment. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, for your is it F of M versus EPS plots, those are, that's an interesting result. I was wondering if you saw or know if there's any shift in the microbial community. Like, yeah. is that extra EPS production due to the same organisms producing more EPS or yeah. different organisms being selected for resulting in the increased yeah. EPS? So I we like did, EPS. So. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we did do sequencing during that time, and so we, we do have 16-ounce Eflacon sequencing. Um, the Zooglia genus has been well understood as producing EPS for a long time, so um, we do see a selection of Zooglia and some other organisms during that time. So I do think there are EPS producers that are selected. Anyone? No more? So let's give Professor Sturm another round of applause yep. then, please. Thank you. Thank you.